great. Thank you uh, for that introduction. Sounds like uh, we're all in the right place to talk about energy, <laughs> energy data. Um, so uh, welcome everyone to this Birds of a Feather session. Um, for those of you that I haven't met already, my name is Emily Lovell and I am one of the OSPO Incubator Fellows. Um, really excited to be here, um, get to do this work. Um, my I came into open source through working with some of the faculty that are on this call actually um, through the professor's open source software experience, which is a training workshop to help faculty um, make this transition over a whole lot of uncomfortable, difficult challenges, <laughs> getting students to contribute to open source projects and learn the skills uh, that go right along with that. And uh, I think it might have been my first workshop. I saw Steve talk about the project that we'll be hearing more about um, today in part, Open Energy Dashboard. And I just remember at that point thinking like, holy smokes, this is, uh, this is like what we're all aspiring to with this sort of work is um, the, a project that is um, really maturing in this way that is designed from the ground up as an educational project. Um, so this is different than uh, one of the sort of complementary models that we heard a little bit about yesterday in the panel, which is embedding your students in uh, projects that are already, you know, out in the broader world, uh, like my students have contributed to Mozilla Firefox dev tools, for instance, um, this is sort of a, a counter model to that. Um, so I thought that it would be really interesting to have a BOF where we talk about this sort of model. And thanks as well to Greg Hislop and Heidi Ellis for helping me sort of brainstorm what this session could be, uh, you know, getting folks together to talk about the, the challenges and benefits of this. Uh, and then that led to uh, inviting Steve to kick us off uh, with a talk at the start, followed by a long, a longer, about an hour of discussion. Um, where we can hopefully sort of swap notes and talk about the challenges that are remaining and some of the collaboration that's already happening to try and address those challenges. Um, so as you can imagine, this involves some different uh, challenges, like I mentioned, compared to throwing students into existing communities. Uh, so I'm excited I saw Steve's slides and I know that he's gonna touch on some of these things. But, you know, having to think about attracting and supporting contributors, managing the associated infrastructure, uh, figuring out how to balance driving your roadmap forward with thinking about student learning. And I'm especially excited because these are things that I'm thinking about uh, in my postdoc for the next couple of years. Uh, since here at UCSC, we have an open source class um, and then we have, you know, incubator fellows who are working on our projects. So we'll be uh, navigating the space a little bit ourselves uh, as well. So without further ado, I'm not going to say too much about Steve because I think he's going to give you a pretty good introduction to his background uh, at the start of his talk. But I will go ahead and hand things over to Steve Huss Letterman of Open Energy Dashboard. Um, one second, please. <laughs> yeah, sure. The magic of technology. <laughs> All right, can you see my slides? Yeah, all good. Okay, sounds like you can hear me too. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, I'm sort of was pleased to hear the <laughs> the discussion before this formal session started because I'm sort of doing a microcosm of what was just talked about. I'm trying to take data at a local level for an institution and make it useful to that institution. So thanks Emily for the introduction. And I just wanna say, I really enjoyed the symposium and I'm glad Cross is doing it. I found it interesting to hear um, different people talk. And I'm gonna start by saying, is everyone having a good day? Are they feeling well, rested, all of that? And I'm partly doing that because we talked about communities yesterday. And I've had to now interface with the sustainability community. And it's really common at their meetings that they make sure everyone's doing well and they do an activity and introduce people and all. And it's sort of, I've been thinking about community. And for me, it's not just the community of my project, but the community of the, that we interface with, that we're trying to support. So I think that's sort of an interesting thing I thought about. 
And I put the word joy into my title because I think it's a surrogate for when things are going well. If students have joy, then they've learned something, they want to stay in open source, and they've had something that's valuable. So that's sort of why I put the word joy into the talk. So as Emily said, I'll tell you just a little bit about me. Um, I taught at UW-Madison for four years when we moved to Wisconsin, and then I went on to Bullock College, which is a liberal arts institution for almost 20 years. And about three years ago, I left, and um, I primarily have invested my time in the Open Energy Dashboard. So I oversee the project, but I also am the primary student mentor. And I'm lucky, privileged enough to be able to do this on a volunteer basis right now. So let me give an idea of what I hope to talk about. Um, and there's lots of things I'm sure we'll go through in the discussion, but give you a little idea of what the Open Energy Dashboard is. And then I'd like to talk a fair amount about what we know and what we, when I say we, it's really what I think, but having heard, talked to other people and heard other opinions. And then I'd like to talk a little about what does it mean to work with a school of higher education, a college or university as an open source project. And I'm gonna give you a few thoughts about an open source project in higher education. And then at the end, you'll have links to the slides, uh, link to the slide, but links about the things I talk about. And as Emily said, we'll have lots of time for discussion and thoughts and ideas to flow through. So let me start by talking about OED. It's web browser based. It's that way because users didn't want people to have to install an app. For example, at a, a big university, they want everyone to be able to just pull up their web browser and use the application. We can acquire the resource data and acquire means we talk to meters. So like in your home or apartment, you probably have energy meters for gas and electric. And we're talking sophisticated versions of those. We archive into a database, we analyze that, and then we visualize it so that people get a sense of what usage is at their organization. And I'll show some slides with pictures in a second. We're in our seventh year right now, the project's continuing to grow. So far we've worked with eight different um, schools, colleges, universities. And I say 154 student semesters because the way I calculate it was it's how many semesters worth of efforts have students give, given so far to the project. And these are students have done substantial work, not ones that did little. And some are counted twice because they work more than one semester, but that's not as common. And right now, um, the project's typically working with three to six schools per semester with seven to 25 students. And uh, the cap is at 25 because when you hear how I mentor students, you'll understand why <laughs> I'm sort of at my limit of uh, capacity right now. And uh, OED is education oriented, which means it's a project that primarily works for student developers. So in that regards, we are unique is in the a unique corner of open source as Emily mentioned. And also core to the mission of OED is working with colleges and universities. So we understand that takes time. We understand we may not develop the actual open sources quickly, but we're getting other benefits that we consider very important to the process. And yesterday, I just wanna mention, we heard from the TOS and Foster Serve groups too. And there's two other projects, this Farm Data 2 that's underneath there that does organic farming um, support. And one you did hear about, from Lori, which is Libre Food Pantry. So they're related projects to this too. And some of what I'll say aligns with what they've experienced too. And just to understand about OED, it's, it's designed to be portable and anyone can maintain it, which means non-IT people, this sustainability person or a student, um, and anyone should be able to use our public features very easily. And as a result, our code is more complex. We're constantly updating menus and making things as foolproof as possible. And that impacts what the students experience as developers. And I just wanted to mention that. So let me show you a couple of quick slides of what OED does. Um, I won't do too much. Um, what you're seeing is a classic line graph here. There's a year of data going this way. This is the usage. Um, down here is electricity of a hypothetical computer science building. This is the gas usage of this hypothetical building. Gas is collected in BTUs, kilowatt hours for electricity. And, but the user in this case chose to use metric units, SI, so megajoules. So we, we decouple what meters collect from what we can show. And that's very important for, from a usage standpoint. And then, oops, sorry, I think I went on too many. Um, 
Oops, sorry, let me get myself, there we go. Um, what I added on this is two things. First of all, this green line is water. And at first blush, you might say, well, wait a minute, water is volume. And the others were energy. But in this case, the user's graphing US dollars, money. So therefore, the system understands how to convert energy and water into money. And then above is a very important feature in OED. It aggregates. So a site can create arbitrary combinations of meters. And so this is the sum of all the, the three below it in this case. So this is an important feature to allow people at institution to show how much a building uses, how much a part of campus uses, how much your whole institution uses. So we've given them easy ways to do that. And I won't say too much about the bar graph. It's a bar graph, with similar aggregations and all. I'll just say in this case, it's showing metric tons of carbon dioxide. So our general system can deal with any unit now. And one of the big ones we've been asked for <laughs> was carbon dioxide. How much are we putting out in the atmosphere? How much of an impact are we having from a sustainability climate change situation? And then finally, just for fun, I couldn't resist doing this. This is, yes, this is Santa Cruz. So I quickly popped it into my demo system. And what it shows here is a visual that says, the larger the circle, the more energy. This is not your real data, but here your student center is using a little less than your engineering center, I don't know if that's true or not, but it does give you a cool visual that shows across the whole campus how much buildings are using, and we can do that. So I'll just um, say that all the changes that developers do have to make work with this whole system. So this is non-trivial, so it's a real world application that we do. And I wanna say uh, one other thing is if anyone is interested in using the dashboard at their institution or having their student developers work on this, contact me and I'd be happy to work with you um, in doing that. Now I'd like to sort of take what, now that you understand about OED and talk about those experiences. And so first I wanna talk about students. So yesterday we heard they're dynamic, they're eager, they're excited, there are a million wonderful things, but they also get discouraged much easier than a typical developer. They get bummed pretty quickly. They also get lost in ways that professional developers don't because of their lack of experience and knowledge. And sometimes they just drop the course in the middle of the semester and they vaporize from the project. Or also not so great, they continue to work because they've got to finish that class even though they don't want to work on your project anymore. So there are balances in working with students. And the biggest, putting all that aside and trying to remember that as I work with students, the, the biggest thing is they come and go after each semester. Very few of our students choose to continue after their course ends. And so we have a developer stability issue and we're trying to address that. One is we're trying to bring on some professional developers, not for paying, but volunteers that really stay with us longer term. We're also looking into the possibility of having what we call student ambassadors, which is a student that's worked on the project that then hopefully would be paid to do work with other students to help that continuity across the project. So we, this is an issue about projects that work with students, I think, that you, know, you have a really high turnover rate. So now I'd like to talk, what do students want to see? What makes them want to work on your open source project? And this is what I've experienced and some others have. The number one thing we hear is sort of the tool-based things. I want skills, I want technologies. That's, I want something that helps me get a job and build up my resume. Another thing they say is, is it cool to me? And cool can be it's used at their school or something they think is interesting. So for example, if OED is used at institution, it's much easier for us to get student developers for obvious reasons. And then another question that's been studied by others too is what impact does it make if a project does something they care about? So in the case of OED, it's about climate change and sustainability. Do students care about that? And Overall, what I have found is the following. There is a non-trivial subgroup. It does appear, as other people have found, to correlate higher with underrepresented groups in computer science who work on OED because they care that it's humanitarian and it's about climate change. But I also, from what students have said, I don't think they would choose OED if we did not have high quality other features, such as the technologies and the other things, the support we give students if just because we're humanitarian. Does that make sense? So it's not enough to drive them to the project, but it's enough to steer them to a good project. So 
let me switch now and talk about what do students want? And they want projects to be easy to set up. And we heard about this yesterday. So we're fully dockerized, so we're containerized. We do this because it works with all the operating systems. It doesn't modify their machine setup, so it doesn't hurt them during their semester. And when they turn it off, it just goes away and takes a little bit of disk space. We've gone so far as some other projects. We don't insist on Visual Studio Code, but we prefer it. And we have a container in there so that when you open up, you clone us, you open it in Visual Studio Code, a little thing pops up going, would you like to start it up? You say yes. It creates a full development environment. It puts the extensions in, spell checkers, linters, you know, debuggers that we think they should be using. And then it installs OED, so it's just ready to go. We even have scripts that automatically install te synthetic test data, so everyone's got it. And to give you an idea where we're at right now as a project, which has been important, it typically takes 30 to 90 minutes for a new student developer to be fully up and running and ready to start coding. And they do that just by reading our web pages and getting going. So out of the 25 students a semester, a few will be contacting me saying I had a problem. But we've really tried to get this down. We think this is important. One, that it's stable, easy to use, and that it's fast. It just gets them into the project and gets them working right away. Another thing they want is clear documentation that answers the questions they want right now. And there's a link there that shows you what we have for developers. Many, we have a number of pages. Um, the way these came about was originally, I worked with a small number of students and got each one set up. I rolled that into documentation, kept adding on to it. The bummer I can tell you is it requires regular updates. The technologies keep changing, things keep changing. So every semester we have to do this. And we're looking towards some things, kind of curious yesterday to hear about screen capture. <laughs> Students have asked for that. They want to see how to set it up. They want to see how to debug, how to interface with React, all those things. Yes, we have a web page with all the things they have to do to get started. They want a checklist. And they want that FAQ to be searchable and indexable and all the other things. So we're working towards that. And finally, probably the most important thing after setup is once they get into the project, they want good help and they want it to be fast. So to give you an idea of what OED does is at a minimum of once a week, I spend 30 to 90 minutes with each student or team and I talk with them in that time. And now you'll see why I have to limit to 25 students, okay? I just, I only have one life, as I joke. And we discuss all kinds of things. What's their status? Are they having issues? Do they need help? Often we're debugging code together so they understand what's going on. And I make sure they know what they're supposed to be working on. So I am serving in many instances almost as a surrogate faculty member to them. And that's, I think, important. In addition, we use Discord because that's kind of cool with the traditional age college students right now. And to give you an idea of, we, I want to see a response to a student in hours and certainly no more than a day. So if something's hanging there after eight hours, and no one else has answered on the project, it's my job to answer that student and make sure they're moving forward. And I want to say this is the minimum. I often meet with students at other times. If they're stuck on something, we'll hop on you know, a video channel and we'll talk about it. We'll share screens and figure out their problem. And I just want to say, I think this is incredibly important for education oriented projects because they have limited time. They have at most usually one semester and often only part of a semester to get done what they need to do. They get hung up for days, they get discouraged and they have a problem in terms of finishing their course to work maybe for their assignments. So, Given that, let me talk about the ways that OED has engaged with colleges and universities. And the primary way we have done that is where it's a major effort in the course. And by major, I mean that at least half their time and half their grade is associated with their work with OED as an open source project. And there's sort of two ways we've done that. The first way is some you've heard yesterday on the panels and other discussions. Everyone in the course is doing this project. And on top of that, course is generally using OED inside. So when I was at Beloit College teaching a capstone course on databases, we talked about databases and we looked at instances of how to do queries, how to do normalizations, how to do optimizations by looking at the code in OED and then having them code things in OED. Now, since then, we've transitioned more to the second way where there's a menu of options. So for example, we have a number of students from um, Monterey Bay in California and they get a list of possible um, uh, projects they can work on and they rank them and then they're assigned to them. 
In another case, for example, at RPI we work with, they hear pitches from projects and then they come and they talk to the projects and decide which ones they can mutually work with. But the point is there's a whole bunch of projects. The professor really isn't involved in the project. They are just handing the students off to the project and then the project is helping them work in the open source world. So that's the primary. The secondary way, which is still non-trivial is students doing internships for a semester, for an academic year over the summer. Do you have an idea of the um, effort level? We usually require at least eight hours a week. That's sort of the minimum we'd like to start at if at all possible. And another important thing I wanna bring up is the vast majority of these students do not receive any academic credit at their home institution. We support that, we'll do that with them, but they don't. They come to us because they want that learning experience, but they don't really care if it shows up as credits on their transcript at the end of the day. They do care if it's on their resume. And I also wanna just mention that for OED, an important goal is engaging and the success of underrepresented and diverse students. That is part of when we have a choice, what schools we choose to work with, and it impacts how we engage with students. And what that means is we will take a second year student and help them get involved. We'll take a fourth year student. We'll take a student that is struggling a little bit more and we will work to have them succeed from where they're starting from. And that does take time and effort from the project. So now let me turn to this question we have within our group <laughs> in class called internal versus external schools. So internal to the school means the school is very involved in the creation and maintenance of that open source project. So the ones that your fellows are doing would fall into that category. The school is heavily involved. When it's external to the school, the school is not heavily involved in the upkeep of that open source project. And it takes a lot more effort, I wanna say, when it's internal to the school. You have to put in that effort to do that. And it's often more tightly integrated with the course or curriculum. People are actively using it in their courses and across courses. And we've heard from a number of places, the other side, when an external project, you need to be really careful about choosing them. And people talked about that. I personally think it's easier to start in the external world to gain experience there and then try doing your own project. You don't have to do that, but you can certainly gain experience without the level of effort and have someone else and a project helping you avoid missteps in dealing with students and other aspects. And I wanna say they're not exclusive. OED, as I mentioned, started internal, it's now external. We are now trying to transition and get some schools to adopt OED where they're helping maintain it, put a longer term effort into it to bring stability to the project and get it more diversified. So let me talk a little about working with another institution. So I'm assuming now that you have a project and you want others to be using it, you wanted them to engage students in it. And from my perspective, I really wanna start one to three months before I ever talk to a student by talking to that fac those faculty members about it. So I wanna have a conversation. I wanna make sure it's a good mutual relationship that both sides understand what's going on. We feel comfortable about it. And the type of things I wanna to talk to them about is how are students assigned? Cause it does seem to impact a little bit their feelings and, and what's going on. I wanna understand you know, the background of those students. I wanna know, do they understand the project languages and the technologies? Where are they coming from? What is their experience in working with a large project if they have that? I also need to understand how much effort and over what time frame they're going to work. I need to dedicate my time, but I also need to understand what they're capable of doing. And in this case, you know, hearing it's a semester isn't good enough. There's always a week or two at the start and time at the end and other assignments. And I wanna understand really, are we talking five hours a week or 15 hours a week? And for, is it for seven weeks or is it 14 weeks? And really critical to me is what are your goals for students? And I'd like to say three ways that colleges and universities approach our project that we have worked with them. And there's other things too. Sometimes it's very specific. I want them to learn JavaScript. I want them to learn SQL. Okay, so there's a very specific goal for these students and they need to work on that. Sometimes it's an area. When I say an area, what I'm saying is I want them to do uh, front end work. I want them to do back end work. I want them to be exposed to testing. I want them to be involved in software engineering principles. And then a third area is um, schools come to say, we want broad exposure. We want them to feel what they feel in industry. So we want them 
to create a web page. We want them to route it back and we want them to get that data in the database. They have to do the whole process there. So they don't get quite the depth of one thing, but they're doing a breath. And we try and work to make sure that those goals are met and to make sure if we can't meet them, we tell people right up front. And finally, I think it's important to understand what the school expects you to provide. And there's a bunch of possibilities because I'm a former professor. Sometimes they're asking me for input into the grades at the end of the semester. Sometimes they want me to tell them if a student is not engaging with the project, not that I'm expected to fix it, but they want to know it so they can correct it at their home institution and do something. Sometimes they are interested in having the project teach students the skills they need or at least provide those resources. And that is a big question because you know we're, we're not doing courses here. So there's a whole bunch of possibilities that schools will want. And I think coming to a good agreement about that is important to being successful in your relationship. So let me also mention, what's the advanced work that after I have those conversations with the school? So first of all, I'd like to have tasks to get the students just started, something that's simple. They touch one or two files, a few lines of code, so they get their development environment up, they learn how to debug, they learn how to create a pull request, and they get the sort of positive, wow, you know, two, three weeks in, they, they have something that's already been accepted by the project, it makes them feel good. Then we have the tasks that are really the core of their work. And here, I think working with students means we have to have those different. So we're often taking our standard issues we, we want to make them more precise. Students just don't have the background often to understand, you know, without precise information about what's expected with them, for them. We also try and point them exactly where in the code, what files they're going to have to work in to make this happen. And if possible, we give them examples of files that already exist that have similar code to what they're going to do. So they have a template to work off to understand how we want it to look, how we do it, and how they can accomplish this task. And that's not something I would do for a developer that's external to a student that has better experience. And as I mentioned, you got to get your documentation up to date and make sure everything's ready before the semester starts. And I already talked about things I'm doing during the semester, so I'm not going to bring those up right now. Just leave it. So one of the things I'll mention, and for most of the academics here, we know this, you need to listen to your students. As I used to say, it doesn't matter if you think you taught the students what they should know, if they couldn't understand it, it didn't work as an educator. So I give them opportunities throughout their time with the project to do this. I'm regularly asking them these three questions at a minimum and others too. Are you happy? That's a surrogate. When I hear students changing their feeling about the project, something has changed either positively or negatively. So then I search for what it is that caused their opinion to change. Are they getting the support they need? So is the help we're giving them what they need when they need it? And then also, do you know what you're going to be doing? Even though we talk about it during the call, I usually end at that point, making sure they are ready to be successful over the next week in doing that. And I also ask them how we can improve all our processes, onboarding, mentoring, documentation. And they often have great ideas. I mentioned some of those before about you know, screen capture and all that. And one thing they often point out is, I thought something was crystal clear. I have to tell you, the biggest one right now is Windows with Docker and making sure they work on the Linux partition. And we now have it bolded on two different web pages with very specific directions because multiple students got stuck there and told us what was confusing them. So hearing it from students really does help. So I don't want to sound like a bummer. I want to tell you, this can be incredibly rewarding. People talked about that in the previous session. They also talked about it takes time, and it does. And the other thing I want to emphasize, it's not a one-shot thing. It's not like you set it up one summer, and then you go away, and you're done. It's ongoing. So getting everything ready for each semester for students to have a really good experience where they are successful and happy means doing the work before the semester and during the semester is my personal opinion and experience. And you have to redo it every semester. The tasks change, the directions have to be updated, all of that. And as you probably all know, there's a crunch at the beginning and a crunch at the end of the semester. When they start, they're all trying to get going on the project and they have questions. And at the end, as someone mentioned yesterday, they're all desperately putting in pull requests to get them cleared out of the project. You've got to give them good feedback. You've got to do your processes and due diligence as a project before you accept their work. And you have to give them feedback in a way that they're able to deal with it and correct it if at all possible. 
And my experience is, you know, one semester I had personal crunches, didn't do quite as well, and the student experience did degrade. They, they told me that. So um, when I was talking to Emily to prepare for this, she said, I told her about this other project, the first one I ever did. And she said, oh, that's kind of interesting. So she said, you should tell people. So I want to say my first project was to help a local nonprofit agency. They had to survey their clients because the federal money they received required them to do satisfaction and other type of surveys. And a whole bunch of agencies across the United States were all of a sudden hit with this as a formal requirement. And I thought, well, here's an opportunity. Let's open source this. And it failed for a variety of reasons. One was the client we chose was not ready to use it. And the administrators lacked the will to really make this happen. Another thing that happened was I didn't work hard enough to get the other agencies to adopt it. So we didn't get traction. And quite honestly, my lack of experience hurt the whole process. So, you know, I'm not, things can be successful, but also be prepared for the ups and downs is what I'm saying. And just live with them and roll with them and adjust to them. OED has pivoted several times. We have changed how we deal with users, how we do certain things, how we interact with students, the level we do it in order to keep ourselves from falling into the failure category. So I think uh, flexibility is important. And then I was at least asked to mention about growing your project. The first thing I wanna say is a lot of the general advice applies. There's, nothing magic. And it does depend on what you're doing, but I can tell you, at least for OED, we had limited traction as a project with schools for a period of time, partially because our primary users are higher education. So it just takes time and effort, whether I'm going to an institution and saying, hey, would you like to use OED for your climate and sustainability, or to get your students to work on the project to give them that experience. And what I've learned is the majority of them never get off the ground. You have that conversation or two and it just doesn't happen because of all kinds of reasons, but it just takes a lot of effort. And that's just another thing that you have to be prepared, particularly with academics. Um, if you've gone to workshops ever, heard cool things about teaching and then not done them, you know why <laughs> this is sometimes doesn't work out as well as you hope. So let me just wrap up here and say about project considerations. You know, what technologies and languages your project uses does impact the students you can work with. Some schools, you know, use a language they haven't taught, the students don't wanna learn it, you're done. Um, and some other projects, um, for example, Libre Food Pantry uses microservices to try and, so you can use different languages. So different projects have taken different uh, approaches to this. Um, another one is, in the case of OED, we have set it up clearly partly because it's a good way to set up a project, you know, with clear APIs and boundaries, but also for students to work. They can work on the database side. They can work in React Redux. They can work on front end issues. They can work on testing. And they can do that independent to a great extent of other parts of the project. And that allows students to get into these larger projects and start working. And most of the students that have continued with us found it really interesting what they did initially and then they branch out in other parts of the project and get into areas they're less comfortable with and have a richer experience with us. And another question is, do you want other people to adopt your project? That is, do you want to take your open source project and make it so other schools can use it at their institution for their educational purposes? I think it's better for the long-term viability. It's why OED is trying to transition that way. But I do think it takes a lot more work and your project has to be in a different state of development than it would be if you were to keep it inside your own school. So promise to leave lots of time for things. There's a bunch of links you have, um, the slides, access to them. We have our website. And the one thing I'll say I haven't mentioned yet is uh, one semester I interviewed three of the students about their experience and I put them together as short videos that talk about what did it mean to engage with OED? Why did they like the experience or not? How did it help them get jobs or how did they feel about it? So that information's out there and there's a bunch of ways to contact me. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Emily and hopefully we'll have a nice discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. I think there's just, uh, there's so much to talk about <laughs> in this space. Um, I think that, uh, you know, my experience in academic research and different labs is like, we often live in this uh, sort of like, 
maybe fantasy land a little bit of like, if we build it, they will come. <laughs> and I so appreciate that in your work with students and with OED, and uh, I mean, so many of these things that you've shared with us, uh, it just really highlights the, a lot of the nuances of the reality, <laughs> which is that like, it's a little more complicated <laughs> than that. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, we have, uh, I think almost an hour for discussion. Um, I have one question I'm gonna throw to Steve, and then I'd like to invite you know, the rest of you, if anyone has questions um, specifically about OED or for Steve. And then after that, we'll open it up to broader discussion about um, projects in this space. Um, but the one thing I wanted to ask a little bit more about is my understanding is that OED started in 2016 at Beloit when you were there. Uh, had its first public release in 2017 and became an independent project in 2018. So I was hoping that you could tell us a little bit more about that progression, um, sort of like who drove that timeline, what were the functional changes to the project through those different stages um, and how the, yeah, how the kind of community evolved around it. Okay. Um. So first of all, why did the project come to be? <laughs> what happened at the start of the session, which is um, Beloit College received a grant. And they could either afford the meters or they could afford a dashboard, but they couldn't get both. So they could either have the data and couldn't look at it or they could look at it and not have the data, neither of which was valuable. And that's why, and then I looked for an open source project and couldn't find one. I was shocked to find that. There's a lot of dashboards out there that are not open source. You do have a great one, by the way, at UC Davis, the seed one. Um, but even that is pretty much locked internal to the UC system at this point, as far as I can tell. It takes a lot of work to set it up. Um, so we launched this project. I was blessed to have five amazing developers, student developers early on. They were just phenomenal people who went on, by the way, to amazing careers right now in industry. Um, why did I decouple? There were a few reasons. One. I have this expression, I say, this is a mission impossible statement, which means I might deny it if you call me out in public that I ever said this. But not long after I started this project, Lloyd College closed their sustainability office. Actually closed it <laughs> for monetary reasons. So I was kind of like, well, you know, <laughs> that kind of limits sort of what traction is going to get internal. And for other reasons, I wanted it to grow. And that is why we turned it around. There was some deliberate planning to be prepared to work with sites early on. So one thing we did was we only did electricity initially. That's all we did. And we proved that the technologies and ideas would work. And then we spent several years generalizing for units and other things and the, the admin interfaces to keep cleaning things up to make it better. So there was some deliberate planning to get to that point at that time to do it. And the, the other reason to, you know, to spawn it off as an independent project was simply to make it easier and more viable for other schools to engage. I think when it's tied to a school, people may question whether you're willing to give them the same level of effort and the same access to things when it's tied. That may not be true, but I think, you know, People may question it. It may be your chair or, or yourself, whatever it is. And the progression hasn't stopped yet. As I said, now we're reaching out to more, more and more schools to work with and do that. Um, there's serious talk um, about spawning this off as its own nonprofit. So we can start accepting contributions um, to support this effort. And those would almost all go towards supporting students. The money we would receive would be to support students to work on the project. We have not talked about trying to get paid staff, like for myself and others, to do it. So, does that answer your question, Emily? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Are there any other uh, questions specifically for, for Steve or about OED before I open it up more generally? All right, well then the first thing I was thinking, I know that there's, I see some of you on this call from the teaching open source uh, broader community that I know are involved with other uh, projects. Uh, for example, um, Libre Food Pantry. So I didn't know if anyone else uh, would be interested in kind of sharing how their experience compares to things that Steve brought up about OED or Scott, you know, your experience working with student developers.
Hi, Scott. Hi, nice to see you again. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, so I'm at Berea College. Uh, since 2014, I was partly hired in to build software for the college using students. Um, and all of our students at our college work in their labor program. So they're all, they all hold 10 hour jobs um, for, throughout their academic fall and spring. And then I extended it a little bit further and started hiring them in the summer under an internships kind of model. Uh, so they would work for 40 hours a week for eight weeks in the summer. And we've, we've had a lot of similar experiences to what Steve described. We've had some really great applications that have survived for eight years now. We've had other applications that made it a year or two and then they died out because they realized, oh, we can actually do this with Excel really easily and um, you know other tools that already existed out there. So um, yeah, so we've had similar experiences. I think some of the takeaways that we had that Steve described that I would, I would echo are our students are leaving very confident, whereas they don't come in very confident typically. Um, we at Berea have a lot of diverse students who often have confidence uh, and, and uh, imposter syndrome issues. And so when we bring them into this cohort, they're all at the same place at the same time, and they're all growing together for, uh, you know, 360 hours over the summer, they really start to build this confidence. And all of a sudden, we start seeing leaders uh, popping up out of our group that kind of fizzle out into the rest of the community at Berea College. And it's had this really cool effect of, of, of really building the conference of all of our students uh, kind of across even that ones that aren't participating in the program. Because um, they're seeing other people who they didn't, you know, they didn't, it, it looks like them and, and they didn't think were confident a year ago, all of a sudden showing all of this, uh, you know, this technical abilities. And like, Where'd you get that? Uh, you know, we're seeing really great uh, uh, alumni are coming back now. We have 50 some alumni who have graduated out of our program now. Um, a whole bunch of them ended up at red, uh, open source companies like Red Hat even. Um, well, like 10 of them are now at Red Hat. It's really cool kind of seeing this bubble of Red Hatians from Berea. Um, and they keep coming back. I've got one in town right now. I, uh, remember Cody Myers, Emily? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's floating around here somewhere. He's taking <laughs> back just to come visit me. So, um, yeah, they they really like to come back. He'll come and talk with my students and just pop in the office and be like, "Hey, what's, how's it going? What can I help you with?" And he doesn't. He's just here to kind of hang out. So that's the kind of community I really love that we've gotten out of the work that we've done. Um, the kind of next stage and the reason I'm really kind of curious and interested in being here is I'm trying to do what Steve did with OED, which is take a software system that's internal and moving it out to these other nine work colleges that we have uh, that all do a similar program to Berea where we hire students to work in our labor program. So that's kind of what I'm curious to hear more ideas about. I'll stop there because I'm taking a lot of time. Yeah, cool. That's really exciting to hear, Scott. Uh, I didn't know that you were at that place with uh, the software developers program. So uh, I have a feeling we might be talking a lot during my postdoc, <laughs> which is great. <laughs> um, and I think um, Carl also is involved with Libre Food Pantry and can talk a little bit about that. Is that right? Sure. Yeah. Thanks for coming. So um, I'm Carl Worst. I'm at Worcester State University in Worcester, Massachusetts. And we're one of the three schools, actually kind of four schools now that are currently involved in the Libre Food Pantry, but one of the three schools that started. So we are a community rather than a specific project. Each of the schools has its own project, but we formed ourselves as a larger community and as a way to um, come up with some guidelines for how we wanted to operate but also as a support system for other faculty who wanted to develop software to manage food pantries on their own campus. So um, it started with Nassau Community College, where Lori is, and they had a food pantry very early, which she talked about yesterday. And they started working with their campus food pantry to develop a mobile app to go along with their mobile apps class. Um, at the same time, Worcester State and Western New England University, where Heidi is, um, had, had, were starting food pantries. This is 2019. And so we had had a discussion at one of the posse 
roundups at SIGSI about this being a good area to work in. It just became the right time to do it because all of our campuses were starting to do this. So in, I think it was spring of 2019, Western New England and Worcester State started working on it. I had already been teaching a software development capstone. I had, had students working in multiple different open source projects over the year. Um, often it was open MRS or one of the open MRS sort of adjacent projects where there were other groups that were using open MRS code to build things for their specific clinics. Um, but we decided that we would try to do something that was more local to our campus. But as we developed this, we were being very careful to try and figure out how we could support other faculty who wanted to do this and make it be something where people could either come into our projects or get us to help them set up their own projects. And that's really where we are. Now, as Steve said, since we're, we are an education-oriented project, um, in some ways, the way the course operates and what the students get out of it is more important than actually getting working code out of it. So we are now three years in at Western New England and Western State. We have portions of the project that work, but it's not actually deployed at any of the campuses yet. Um, we're getting a lot closer. We have, as um, Steve also mentioned, we're, we're doing microservices as a way to basically make it easy for different instructors to take a section of the project and just rewrite, have their class rewrite it in whatever languages and tools they use and still have it work with all the other pieces of the system that we have. Um, so we have some of those pieces working. We haven't really integrated all the pieces yet. And deployment is being a big challenge just because number one, we need to learn more about things like Kubernetes and so on that we haven't really done much with yet. Um, Amazon Web Services has given us a bunch of credits to use so that we can try deploying it there. Um, we're still learning how to do that. Um, but also, that's not a long-term solution for where it should be hosted for the campuses, because those credits are not directly to the campuses, they're to the project itself. And so we've got to think more about how, for example, when when Worcester State is going to host their, or is going to deploy it, are they going to host it on a server that our IT department manages? Or are they going to go outside and pay for it, which seems unlikely? Um, so trying to set up that kind of thing is also an interesting challenge that we're looking at right now. But we do have a whole bunch of stuff on our website, a bunch of code. Um, we have some workflows. We have code of conduct and things like that that people can look at. and. We are starting this semester, we have a fourth school coming and working in a small part of it. In the City University of Seattle, there is one faculty member there who has some of his students working in part of the security aspects that we haven't had a whole lot of time to work on. And so we're hoping to start bringing other schools in to either work in the code we have or again to start modifying it to run on their own campuses. The reason we haven't built one system is because the various food pantries work significantly differently. And it's very hard to see right now how we would design one system that would be either general enough for everybody to use, but have enough features that it's going to satisfy what their campuses food pantries workflow is like. And one of the biggest challenges I've had with my students is they look at the way the food pantry works and say, that's stupid. Why don't they do it this way? It would be much more efficient. It's like, no, that's not your job. Your job is to provide what they need to take their current workflow and make it easier for them to do what they do currently, not to change how they work. And so, you know, at Worcester State, we're very focused on getting the data about the people coming to the pantry, but inventory, here's the stupid one. Our inventory is measured in pounds of food in the food pantry. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's a single number. Okay. Um, whereas at Western New England, they're actually headed toward, well, they were having a, an, a system where students could order food remotely and then pick it up in a 
in a site that they felt comfortable visiting rather than having to go to the food pantry itself. And at um, Nassau Community College, they're working very specifically right now on inventory and on being able to tell whether food is past its um, use by date, not sell by date, but use by date, and having their app built so that the, the, um, the staff at the pantry can go around and say, no, we got to get that off the shelf now. And so we, you know, all those things might be useful for multiple places, but they're not yet useful in all the places yet. It's really interesting to hear about your experience, Carl, because we've been talking a lot about ecosystems and ecosystem development. And it sounds like with Libre Food Pantry, it's a really interesting example of like an ecosystem that actually has multiple sub projects in it at different stages, but you're all navigating like, you know, sort of thematically similar challenges. So. Yeah, and part of the reason we did that was specifically because we figured none of us by ourselves would have enough time to really do all of this. And we're worried that things like, for example, at Worcester State, we do it one semester out of the year because my course only runs one semester. So we would have a dormant project for a semester, but we have other campuses that, that work different semesters. And so we have a continuity there. And we have done some work across the campuses as well. So what Western New England is building, what Worcester State is building are very similar. We've actually pointed student teams at each other saying, oh, you want to know something about CICD? That group over at Western New England has been working on it. Ask them. They've probably already tried it. Or um, I had some students, I had too many students this semester for our own food pantry project. So we just, we started building a back end for the Nassau Community College um, mobile app because they don't do back ends. Which is, I mean, that's an interesting model. We use that a little bit when I was co-teaching at the same time as Heidi during one semester where students are talking across um, institutions, which I also think can be so interesting because it's a way to give them a sense of like um, professional collaboration with people that they don't, you know, maybe even know at all, um, but around like a technical topic. It's really hard though. They don't want to talk to anybody. Not yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's been my experience too. <laughs> Um, and what about, um, I was going to ask you, Carl, what do you feel like is your biggest challenge, like your biggest limiter right now for your project at Worcester? Um, time, probably. Um, yeah. I, I'm, I'm on my sabbatical this semester, so I'm working on trying to get more of it done. But I've come to the conclusion that it doesn't work as well as I'd hoped to just set students loose on it and say, here, you need to figure out how to get and identity and access management system working. Here's mm -hmm. the one we should use that already exists. It's an open source one that's out there. And they just don't, they just, it's happened like two years in a row. What I get is I get summaries of lots of documentation they read, but nothing that's actually usable. Right. So we've kind of come to the conclusion that we need to give them a really basic example and then turn them loose on modifying it by having them start the things from scratch even if you give them designs and point them at things, it's just not working as well as we'd hoped. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Too that optimistic, makes... I guess. Yeah, okay, great. And then Lori added, um, I know Lori's having uh, less stable internet, but Lori's also involved with the same project, Libre Food Pantry, um, and said in the chat that uh, her biggest challenge or limiter is rapid changes to Android development and trying to keep up with the changes and decide what to update in the app versus what to keep, um, even if it's an older approach. So that's an interesting problem around dependencies that uh, can also be relevant if you're uh, leveraging things beyond your, your particular project um, technologies and such. Well, I, I have questions that I could post to the group, but I wanted to give space if anyone here or on Zoom has questions, you can feel free to type them in the chat or just jump in. Kind of yeah, go ahead, Carlos. So um, we have, you know, here at UC Santa Cruz through Cross and also the OSPO, we have, um, uh, I, I think I've, I've heard two approaches to involve students in, in open source projects. One is uh, through a project, right, where you want to basically pour a project. I mean, both of them are project-based, but one of them is, I think, more classroom-oriented, but the other ones is more mentor-oriented, so correct? Hmm. 
so it's it's more like a mentorship relationship you have with students the mm -hmm. first one right the oeb one mm -hmm. well the second one is a classroom context right if i'm correct me if i'm wrong i think i see what you're saying yeah and carl maybe if you want to jump in you can yeah so let me just ask the question so mm -hmm. that i mean uh, there's sort of like there's a two different approaches right and so one is i think in the classroom you have sort of this responsibility to accommodate all the students that are in the classroom uh, and make them succeed to some extent. I mean, obviously there's limits to it, but there's you 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 get the the people into the classroom and then you your job is to basically manage them, right? And and make them successful as best as you can as a, as an instructor. Well, if you if it's more like a mentor relationship, you have more the it's 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 not so much a collective responsibility but it's more you know you're more acting in the interest of the project and so you can in some sense more pick and choose who you want to work with um and so i find this tension really interesting right because we do uh sort of a, a mentorship model in the form of you know we, we attach ourselves to google some of code and there is very much an, an extreme of where you spend a lot of time finding good matches between mentors and students and then you know you ignore all the all the cases where there was not a good match right and i've sort of heard you saying a little bit there is actually quite a bit of load in your in your project just to deal with cases where there was not a good match um so that's why i'm interested in this trade-off right what do you prefer what is what are the advantages of one meant of the mentorship model versus the classroom model and maybe this is a wrong dichotomy <laughs> let me know if that's not the right way to look at it i think i'm curious what others will have to say too i saw steve just unmute himself but i think in my experience which is more limited than steve's or carl's <laughs> so i should really let them talk but in my limited experience i've experienced it more as a spectrum of like you can have all the way at one end of the spectrum you might have um, like a mentor who's working in industry who's mentoring a student or a grad student who's mentoring a student on like an in on um, a project that maybe they're not familiar with um, and then you have uh, you know in the classroom you could have multiple situations um, where the instructor it's either their own project or another project and they could be providing like sort of a mix of like more classroom instruction model where like there's not going to be a great fit all the time and you do what you can to meet students and see kind of how far they can come to meet you um, or that it might be your own project so you're putting a lot more into it um and steve i'm actually probably has a lot of things to say about this he just sent me a paper draft that talked actually quite directly to some of these questions so i will stop talking and let steve or carl or someone else jump in yeah so first of all i think there is a difference i'm not I classify it as a dichotomy mm -hmm. because I think teachers are a type of mentor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they are providing a certain level and good teachers do it well. Having said that, if you have a really large class, it gets more and more difficult to do the high touch work. So it does depend on the institution you're at and all kinds of things. Um, I think, you know, I've done both. I will say that for OED, we work with quite a range of students, as I mentioned. And I think we are sometimes assigned to teams. So we'll go to a school, they'll say, okay, we're gonna have students and these students just show up. It's not as if we choose them, it's who is assigned to us. And we work with them and we have rarely had a complete failure. We've had students have dropped out of courses and things like that, but I'm not sure I blame the project directly on that. Um, so I would say, it does require more effort. And again, that's why when I said OED cares about diversity and underrepresented students, I meant that it isn't a win for the project as an open source project, if you think of it objectively like that in that framework. But if you think about it in terms of getting a student to a better place with better experience and more confidence and avoiding like imposter syndrome and all those things, then you have done the work, I think. And as a net, it's it's a win to our project because of the goals of our project. And as Scott mentioned, you know, 
it, it does improve them. They feel better, but there's also paper out there that said, hey, students who work in open source sometimes have less confidence at the end of the semester than at the beginning. And I think partly it depends on their experience. So I think there are students out there that need more help, that need more guidance, that you have to be more careful about the selection of what they work on, the sequence they work on things, how you get through, like Scott put something in exactly what we do, give them an easy task so they get that, wow, two weeks in, I already got something approved by the project, they feel great. And for some students that's critical and for others, it isn't as important to them. So I think it's a matter of, that's why I said, for me, understanding the students at that institution, that who I'm getting, who I'm talking to, getting to know them at the first meeting, and then approaching them in a way that's more likely to be successful. I'm not saying we're perfect at this by a long shot, but I think there are ways to be successful in the same way that there are groups and institutions in higher education that are very successful at working with diverse students and getting high success rates across those students. So I don't have an answer to the question of how do you make that work with limited resources. Okay, mm -hmm. that's what we're trying to look into students. You know, I've worked in diversity efforts with peer mentors in the past and things like that. So I think there's things to try, but I think this is a really big question. If we're gonna make this work on a larger scale, we need to come up with scalable models that don't depend on a limited number of dedicated people to be successful. I think it's great that we do it, but I also don't think it's the final model. And I think, there's work in the grant we're doing to try and make that happen. Well, and Scott, I think you can correct me if I'm wrong, but something that you were talking a little bit about earlier is um, with the Berea software developers that there's some like leadership within the student software developers. Is that right? So that you have students who are supporting um, other students and maybe that can help as one strategy to kind of manage this challenge that all of us are facing. Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, so we have we have leadership at actually multiple stages now because we've been doing this for eight years. So I actually have a software engineer who's on staff who is a full time there. All they do is work with the team. That helps a lot. Uh, I also have a alum. We have a program at Bria where an alum can get hired for up to two years after they graduate. So they're 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 recent grads. They're not like fully removed from the students. Many of them were classmates with them a year ago. They also provide mentorship because they're working for 40 hours a week now too. Then we have a software, uh, software team lead student. So one student who worked closely with the leadership team to kind of be that, that eyes and ears between the students and the staff to kind of make sure there's issues like between teammates and they don't want to bring it up. They have a student they can talk to and get mentorship there. And then probably the most important piece for me is when they're working in the summer for that eight week period, uh, they work for about a week with one team, with one, with one partner. And then I switch them up intentionally so that they work with another partner. So they'll, they'll work with four to five of the people in the room over the summer uh, just to, you know, see how other people are coding, learn from the mistakes other people have made. You know, one team might be doing Ajax calls and then they get, you know, moved on to you know, some other thing. That learning happens across those teams. And I, I, because each team is learning something slightly different, they all have expertise in something that they can then provide to the other teams. And so there's, there's a, a lot of, of peer mentorship that happens just kind of naturally by making them, forcing them to switch up every week or so. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And that students, I, I like that you highlighted too, that students are not just getting um, exposed to different skills, but they're also seeing like different ways that other students like write code and like to even just talk about their code and that kind of thing, which can be I, also so valuable. Yeah. There's a question. Oh, yep. Hi, um, I'm Ethan. I haven't introduced myself or anything. Um, I just want to point out, it's that student driven model where uh, you have students uh, looking up to other students as project leaders or as partial leadership in a project is not so different from how things work in the industry in mm -hmm. general. So I think that's kind of an interesting point to make that that could be one of the closest situations to what actually happens in the industry also. 
Yeah, I think that's a really great point. And I mean, part a lot of Scott, I used to, I worked with Scott for three years uh, at Berea College, which is how I know him. Um, and I know that um, so much of his work is motivated by trying to really give students that experience. So I, I really appreciate you highlighting that because I think it is uh, a really, really good point about that type of uh, mentorship and leadership model. Stephanie. You put something in the chat that I, I was going to ask you to say a little bit more about, about mentorship models and... Yeah, no, I thought it was interesting that when Carlos was bringing up what we typically do here at, uh, at Cross and at, now at the OSPO, that um, we had a, a big push where we, I really got started on this is through kind of the GSOC model. It was always been something that I've struggled with is that I do find it's a less a uh, diverse pool of students that we if we have typically gotten. It's getting a little bit better, but uh, it's typically been, you know, it, I wouldn't call it particularly, uh, uh, yeah, I wouldn't call it particularly diverse. And I think that that, and I, I all have worried that that's a, it's almost a self-selecting or uh, it's either self-selecting or uh, the fact that you're trying to match somebody between two people who feel comfortable with each other. Um, is that in some way um, potentially creating um, barriers to folks who are not, you know, her, her, you know, some, some level of barrier to folks that are are coming from historically excluded groups, and we're not doing like thinking it through and not recognizing it. And I guess that would be a question I throw out: is like, how do you deal with that? Like the mentorship matching thing has worked great, even though we had a few. I think this year is that you know, because we had a much bigger pool of students or a much bigger set of students, a cohort, we had more couple failures which we haven't had in the past but even percentage-wise we're still talking in like an 80 percent success rate or plus plus that um over the last four years so it's a pretty high i mean I, I find it a pretty high rate of success but at the same time yeah for me it's been really a challenge not to like look at the the pool of students we mm -hmm. have they're all great but i wouldn't say they're typically like representative of i mean we don't i, I don't see them having like historically excluded uh, groups really represented in that. And so I'm trying to figure out the, like how to balance that, I guess, is my question. Well, and it, it kind of goes back, I think, to the, um, the keynote that Demetrius presented mm -hmm. yesterday, yeah. where yeah. she was talking about like, great, we have like 82, in their case, 82% of people responding to their survey saying they feel like they belong in open source, but like, like we really have to care a heck of a lot about, even though that's an impressive number, what about the 18%? Um, it's kind of what I hear you saying about right. the, and I love Demetrius's point was that it's great 82 are so happy and the other 18% are like it's not there's not a spectrum between yay we like it oh it's okay it's, this really sucks <laughs> it's like we really like it oh I feel like nobody respects me at all it's like there's nothing in between so I, I think that her point was great so anybody who didn't get a chance to see that we'll be having the video up it was a really great point. yeah, yeah. Just to interject really quickly, you know, and it's 18% is kind of a weird number because that, that's a, that 100% that is self-selected, yes, right? Yes, that's what I was So I was going to say 18% I mean, is, is possibly actually more representative of the majority of the population mm -hmm. than the 83, 82%, right? right. Uh, this is actually the number that I'm really interested in. It's like how many people are actually exclude, excluded in, in, in absolute numbers, uh, you know, compared to that little crowd that's in, in software engineering today. Yeah. Well, and and to your question, Stephanie, it's like, who are the people, yeah, who are the people who are not included in the survey that Demetrius was talking about? Who are the people that are not even getting into the program? So I was just gonna ask maybe if you could say a little bit before we throw this question out to everyone about how students apply to GSOC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so for, I think people have, if you haven't worked with GSOC, it's, it's, I think, a very good program. And I have to admit, they get like thousands of students that they get working on open source projects over the summer or for three month period. And so, I mean, I, I have a great shout out to the amount of work that they do. Um, but they, what happens is that at first, it's the organization's responsibility to become a mentor organization. And that's what we've been doing every year. Uh, we write up basic application and say, yes, we, we have these projects that we want students working on. And then our, you know, our mentors, including like Oscar, who's in the room, and a bunch of other folks um, will create project, uh, project ideas, and then those get posted. And the students from all over the world then see those ideas and come up with their a project proposal um, that, they, that they will want to work on over the summer. And it will be uh, with that mentor. So the mentor has the kind of typically 90% 90 something percent of the time has the initial idea, but it's up to the student to actually create the project. 
uh, and the timelines and everything, but in coordination with the mentor. So that's where the self, that's where the matching happens because the, this typically the uh, mentor and the student have worked together before the application. So there's kind of like a pre, like the, the mentors have already kind of ranked the students even mm -hmm. before the pro, for a proposal goes in because of that interaction. And that's also why I think uh, we've had such a, I mean, why it's such a, generally for at least our perspective, it's been a pretty successful, if you're thinking about it from the open source project's perspective, as opposed to maybe from the student's perspective or, you know, general, like, um, like the general perspective, but from the other, our project's perspective, it's been successful because there is that pre-selection. Um, and then the students work together, the students work with the mentor over the three months when they've been selected um, officially. And, uh, and then, um, and they get stipend, they get paid uh, stipends from the Google Summer of Code. So we don't pay, we don't have to cover their costs, they do. And our mentors work with them. And I think typically, I'm, I'm gonna look over, I'm not gonna look at Oscar when I say this, typically they only work about five hours a week with their students. I'm not sure if you would fully agree with that this year, <laughs> but that's supposed to be how it works. Um, but, and so I think, it, it, you know, that's that's kind of the, 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 the model, the ideal. So. And so that, and we have we've taken that model for our um, open source uh, uh, research experience program, the OSR the OSRE um, as well. And so we have a very similar one. So we use GSOC. We, we GSOC is we kind of took the GSOC model and then added an ability to bring in more sponsors so that we can bring more students in on a similar model. And in that case, we've tried to really focus a bit more using those sponsorships in particular on bringing in the excluded, like uh, historically excluded groups. But for instance, one of this year, we were able to get a specific uh, um, fellowship just for uh, students from uh, HBCUs. Mm -hmm. And that was actually sponsored by Baskin Engineering, which was great. Um, but, you know, that's just one fellowship out of all the ones we've, we've done. So I, you know, obviously want to, I'd like it to be that HBCUs are represented just in our general cohort, not mm -hmm. just like a specific fellowship that was specifically had aimed at that. You know, it's that's where that's where I'm going. And we've actually, you know, reached out to we're just getting started on um, reaching out more to HBCUs to get more applications from them. But also a lot, and and Demetrius was one of those folks who kind of got me, got us thinking about how to do that in a more effective way where we would go, we meet and she talked about this a lot in her presentation about meeting them where they are mm -hmm. and not making assumptions. And I think mm -hmm. that, that was that really resonated with me when we had conversation about that and when when she brought it up again yesterday as well. And Thona, Thona Humphreys joined us this morning. I don't know whether she's still on, but um, uh, she is from Norfolk University, right? So she is actually a professor at uh, HBCU and, and she, has, um, she has given us incredibly good advice on, on how to, you know, how to make uh, GSOC more accessible mm -hmm. to, to historically excluded communities. And, and, and it was really about, you know, webinars. You have mm -hmm. to really go, you know, just without the positive mentorism, which Stephanie just mentioned, right? You have to really improve students and create create environments where they are sort of safe in numbers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and not uh, expect them to sort of in isolation, contact an arbitrary mentor somewhere on the web page, uh, right? To to make contact, and so this this is this is a, was for us a, a huge eye opener to 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 that, that that there is a lot that needs to be done in mm -hmm. order to. On the other hand, I have to say one of the goals of the OSPO is to um, use the open source research experience um, also to discover. A lot of the open source activities in the C in, in, in the University of California system, right? So this is a tall order, and we want to make this program very, very attractive for mentors. Mm -hmm. And and it's not just a, um, a you know, it's not so like the, the National Science Foundation have they have a research experience program, right? And the way that works is basically you get um, a bunch of students assigned to a university. Then the university gets some financial incentive to take care of them over the summer, and then they have some opportunity to become, you know, exposed to actual research, mm -hmm. right? And there is no actually matchmaking going on, right? They basically just get sort of confronted, make it work, right? And I've been uh, subjected to this program, and as a mentor, it's not very satisfying, right? It's not a good experience. It's a lot of work, and it's um, unless. And, and it's, you know, you, 
you, you find sometimes if you're lucky you find good fits right um where it's fun to work with the student but a lot of it is, is actually not working too well it's not a good experience right and so um so it is, it's really depending on your mission and of the, you know where you want to go with and what challenges you want to face um not every mentor um you know is necessarily uh wants to you know uh, create an opportunity for students no matter what they have often very practical uh goals right we need to get this project off the ground at, and you know we have like we need we have paper deadlines we have um you know there's some research and there's tenure on the line right so it's, there's some pressures there and we want to get those people too we don't want to create an extra burden for those people so there's a tension here um between um you know that's what i was essentially trying to bring out right and and i think we you know what i like to get to is that um that all the effort of bringing the onboarding effort right um it is so similar across different domains mm -hmm. there got to be some help that we can provide right uh, across all these different communities and i'm i just want to sort of point out i mean i'm really struck by uh, the first speaker who's basically talking about this onboarding experience being so important right where mm -hmm. you where you create very quickly uh this development environment and, and and one community i was absolutely blown away that i think did a fantastic job is the rust community i don't know whether anybody has seen essentially the uh there's like introductory videos of of and rust is a weird community right they they basically want to replace c plus mm plus -hmm. that is a tall order right and yeah. they are sort of in the same runtime uh, ecosystem because they use the same intermediate representation as C++, but they are essentially trying to fix everything that's wrong with C++. And their approach towards onboarding is just awesome. They come like you you can't really stop working with Rust until without having immediate access to like a sandbox where you could uh, instantly try out things you know, and, and in just listening to some of these talks when they introduce Rust to the communities, uh, you can't help but actually try and you want to try it out. You wish you had more time to actually really play with it, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so th for me, that's like a great example yeah. of of onboarding done right. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, and so I think uh, uh, I think we can probably learn from that and and, and provide maybe for various ecosystems, right? I mean, all these these projects that we're talking about are sort of part of a larger ecosystem, whether they're, you know, Python projects or, um, you know, other programming languages, each of the programming languages have their own ecosystem. There might be really uh, ways where we can create some help, right? And projects that, that make onboarding easier for, for people to, you know, to, to, to get students on board. Yeah, I think that's certainly a like a related to general accessibility for any project, but especially felt by students that are historically excluded. Yeah, or, mm -hmm. yeah. that first experience yeah. is so super, critical. super important. Yeah. I mean, because if it's an error, it's like, ah, yeah, you know, I expected that, right? It's mm -hmm. like it's typical me. I don't have any idea. I'm too stupid for this, right? That's and I've seen that so often and I'm so mad every time it happens because you can't undo that experience. Yeah. yeah it is yeah, really tragic. Yeah. Um I want to come back to Stephanie's question in one second, but say go ahead. Well I, with five minutes left, I have two questions. Um, <laughs> sure. So we may not cover either of them, that's fine. Uh, one one is for, for the entire group. That, that's doing this great work. Um, at, at, at CMU, there, there's a group that helps with, with teaching and, and, and learning, and they recommend this book called Entering and Mentoring. I don't know if hmm. it's like that or not, um, by someone named Christine Plund, who does this kind of research at Wisconsin. Um, the second is communications channels. Um, do people have observations about whether particular communications channels feel more or less inclusive? I've been to increasing number of meetings where people say let's just set up a slack channel mm -hmm. i'm not thinking you know, <laughs> I, I do i do the same thing let me, let me turn the mirror myself and people have said i don't like slack mm -hmm. I, I don't want to install it i don't want to use it why does it have to be mm -hmm. the channel i'm just curious if there's been any feedback on that. Yeah. 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 
So we chose to use Discord, partially because students are already comfortable with it, most of them. Um, it also does not require you to register to join our servers. So you don't, you can just basically join because we have a public link for people to join. Um, we didn't want to use other systems where people had to actually ask to be allowed into the server and have some sort of subscription. Um, but again, yeah, so we have we have a larger Discord server for the community. We have others that are being used by individual classes. But in fact, in the last two or three weeks, we've been working on what our policy is for should these should these be open for what's going on in the classes? And how are we going to announce that so who know so people know this is what's going on over here in this other sort of sub server for this part of the project. Um, clearly, anything that's going to talk about how the class actually works and how students are graded can't appear there. So there's the fine line that we have to walk there. But the students talking among themselves to build things can certainly be open. And we've been putting those kinds of things up at, in our announcements as here, there's another server where this group is working on this part of the project. Anybody who wants to go watch what they're doing, we can. Scott's left. Yeah, I'll try to make this really, really brief. Yeah, say a couple of things, everything that's been said in the last 15 minutes, whatever. One, I think from the keynote, one important takeaway for me was it's who you're getting students from that was really critical. And that's why I said who we choose to work with as a project makes a big difference in who we're actually mentoring. So that, that's one thing I just wanted to say. It's a hard problem, but. And then in terms of communication channels, yeah, we use Discord because it's hot right now with students. Having said that, students who are on Teams find their own ways to communicate. Mm -hmm. They have their WhatsApp or text messages or Signal or whatever app you want to choose that they use. The bigger question I have and the concern I have is getting them out of that mode and getting them into the public spaces and using them. Because I think that's a professional development question. I think they build community and that's important. So we have been pushing as a project for that reason to get students to use the more public channels. But I will say I've not had a problem once the students are on the project of them communicating. They do it however they want. They like doing it when I can't see it and that's okay. But <laughs> there are some negatives to that. I think a more important question from my perspective is the communication channels we use to attract students, whether it's through a school or others, it's the bigger gateway to getting students involved has been my experience, not once they're on actually working on the project. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I mean, my experience basically just, you know, parallels everything that was just said, although I want to highlight a couple of things um, from the chat, uh, you know, to the sort of talking about how we get diverse students. Um, Scott also highlighted, and I was thinking about this as well, uh, Scott highlighted, when I need mentors that represent my current students, I look towards my alumni, um, having them come back, you know, whether it's visiting and talking on LinkedIn, um, doing resume reviews with students uh, kind of related to that. I was just thinking about, you know, I think as we have more diverse mentors that also will attract more diverse students naturally. Right. I mean, it's a hard like pipeline issue, but um, but hopefully, you know, something that with time will will shift uh, and with uh, yeah, communication, my experience has been really similar. I think to everyone else here that I found it really helpful to have students use something like Slack. One thing that I don't think anyone has outright said, but that I've found to be very, very true in my experience with students is that student, many more students are comfortable approaching me on Slack than via email, which I did not expect necessarily to be the case. Um, and so that's one reason that I, when I was teaching had students on Slack, I don't think it really matters in that case, whether it's like Discord, Slack, um, a similar thing, but to essentially like strip away the the layer of like 
potential stress or anxiety around the formality of email that feels really different. Um, so I really emphasized to my students when I was teaching like, hey, like we have a Slack channel for this class. Also, you can DM me on Slack if you don't want anyone else to see the conversation. And it's just like sending a text message. So, you know, I think that um, I found that also be really helpful for some students who might not be as comfortable talking in class. Um, but to provide, I think also just providing multiple ways of students being able to have those communications. But I appreciate the book recommendation. I hadn't heard of that one, so I'm going to look that up. Um, all right, can I toss something in on yeah. the Slack, Discord, et cetera? Thing, um, is I actually don't have an opinion on one being better than the other. You can actually set up a link where everybody can join Slack. So that isn't just a Discord thing. But I would definitely, like, definitely think about what you're trying to accomplish because um, outside of even where are the students already, um, Discord tends to be, it is a, is a social channel effectively. And so it's not as good at keeping people segregated, like topic wise, right? Because it's not meant to. So this is not a problem, it can be good, right? But it can mean that conversations tend to, they don't stay in the right channels ever. <laughs> Whereas like, <laughs> but it generates more conversation, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah, on the yeah, other yeah. hand, Slack yeah. is a very, if you're ever trying to make Slack into it, because uh, I worked for a company that was just trying to make it into like a social chat channel. And it's not good for that because right. Slack is designed to like be like, no, get out of general. There is a specific mm -hmm. channel to talk about mm -hmm. this. There are threads, mm -hmm. you know, like the thread thing is a yeah. big part of what keeps it less chaotic. So mm -hmm. it can be less engaging in some ways. But if you want it to be, you know, so it depends on like what you're doing. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. if you have people that are more, you know, the projects are, you know, they're still split up and they're all working on different things. You know, it can have that. Whereas like, and also if you want to have to be able to go back and reference anything, mm -hmm. Slack is usually better than Discord just because Discord is so free form. Like if they do create the channels and you can create them, but it's really, you have to basically moderate them like crazy to try and keep them on topic. Um, whereas like just by design, Slack tends to nudge people into um, working different ways. So depend that that's my, as somebody who's thought way <laughs> kind of stuff, <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's my short version on like, if you're like, how do I decide which way to go? Yeah. yeah. Uh, sure. well, why is that? Well, so is, I mean, I, I, I'm mostly on Slack. I use Discord a few times. So like you, you can create channels on Discord, right? Mm -hmm. so people just don't stay there because it's not the habit. Like, why are they different on this portal? You see all of the channels. You see all the channels. In Slack, you, you have, have to problem. join. You have to like. Oh, you have to join. You have to join. And the right. other thing in like, so in Discord, there's a lot of effort by people who are running Discord to basically make a functionality a little bit more like Slack to sort people. Uh -huh. So they'll have a thing like click this emoji and then they'll have a bot that says anybody that clicks that emoji gets added to these slightly secret channels. Uh -huh. Yeah, and is, is like, yeah. whereas like Slack does, is like, yes, channels exist. You will only see a certain number of channels when you join automatically. By default, Discord will dump you in everything unless exactly. you start doing these kind of crazy shenanigans, which most people do. Uh -huh. But like, you have to set up a bot, you have to like yeah. figure out what the ranks are, and like you're you're basically forcing it to do something it doesn't want to do because mm -hmm. Slack was built as a productivity tool mm -hmm. and Discord was built as a social tool. And right. all social media yeah. is trying to flatten everything because it increases the engagement. This is super interesting. Yeah. yeah. I, I talked about the source project, uh, source graph, you know, they have uh, uh, so this is up a Discord, and they told me once this is up a Discord, engagement is 10x. So maybe, so uh, I didn't know what the reason. Maybe the reason was that for most work things, it's Slack, right? So Discord basically is something you do for fun, yeah. right? But like for open source people, it's work, right? So, <laughs> so right, like for organizer of open source, maybe for open source projects, yeah. it's fun. So uh, that's a very interesting point. Yeah. Yeah, it's just and, and you can, there's no rule that says you have to do one or the other, but you just will, if you do Discord, it's never going to be very organized. It's going to be very chaotic. And if you use Slack, it's not going to be as engaging. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, I think that's a really great distinction. We're almost out of time, but go ahead. Yeah, very directly related, right? So one of the hardest thing when I was using Slack in the classroom was to get people to actually use channels that were shared with their peers and not just direct messaging with me. <laughs> um, have you observed differences with Discord and Slack of the willingness to actually use shared channels versus direct messages? Um, it's harder to direct message on Slack. It's just for fun. Uh -huh. Or not Slack on, just on Discord. Discord. Like yeah. it's less, 
it's less intuitive and so people are less likely to do it uh -huh. um, but it's um as i said it just starts becoming like the trade-offs in the culture mm -hmm. there are like there it is you know one of the things that we do not related in the school environment but unsurprisingly we have the same problem because people are the same everywhere where they're like i want to ask somebody personally and not ask publicly mm -hmm. And so the way we kind of do it is we'd ask the people that message like our developer advocates questions if they would mind reposting in the main channel so that everybody can see the answer. Yeah. Or alternatively, if they weren't comfortable doing that, the developer advocate would go in and be like, here was a question that was asked. <laughs> yes. and here is the answer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's yeah, it's a little annoying, but you know, also like yeah. but it's 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 one of those things, you know, that I try, I try to teach in open source communities, right? That people have to become more comfortable. Yeah. Uh, to be in, in the public, right? Because it's it's sort of like the, the open source way is very much, you know, it's all, you know, and that's one of the reasons why a lot of people are hesitant to join open source projects because they are just much more comfortable having sort of this traditional manager, I'm just a cog in the system kind of thing. I don't want to expose myself to these, all these big scary. You have to like lure people in and like get them to take little tiny steps, which is why like so many of the tools in the community managers toolbox is things like, like if you've ever wondered why people are like, oh, why do they want me to like click a quiz? Like, why is it, why am I being asked for my opinion? Click on this emoji. It's because like that kind of small engagement gets people more comfortable with larger mm -hmm. engagements, you know, because then they've like, they've done a thing or like, there's a lot, like, it's really funny because Slack has a fair number of people building bots that are meant to be engagement tools. Like there's one that like is kind of for doing like a, what do you call it? Like a question and answer period, like an mm -hmm. open, okay. like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Me. yeah, yeah, that sort of thing. But it's called, there's something else, like, especially because in, in like a company context, but it's like, it's called like, I think it was a jelly bot or something like that. And it's like, people can submit questions and then people can vote on the questions yeah. and yeah, then you yeah. can like later then answer the questions and it's like yeah all of this is a little bit ridiculous when somebody could just do it but like you kind of give people the structure and people like the more you can structure something in my experience the more safe people feel like putting that toe in the water and then once they do it and they start getting answers like it becomes a little bit easier that's fascinating so to be fair yeah you will not get most people in the deep end of the pool like and this is true even even in forums like uh i think like glow which had a huge huge massive presence you know four hundred thousand posts created every week um were created by less than one percent of the user base right like like people just don't want to talk <laughs> <laughs> we are we're over time so i'm just gonna I, I appreciate you sharing all that i just want to be respectful of people somewhere they need to cruise off to you're welcome to hang around and keep talking about any of these things i do just i want to say two final things just to tie things back to um community one i just wanted to highlight steve's comment that uh picking a platform where you can use text for the initial contact and then transition seamlessly to voice or screen share can be really helpful um, also for helping students have access. I thought that was a really good point. And then the last thing I wanted to say, which ties into some of what you were sharing, um, Rachel, is that right? About, okay, I'll say <laughs> um, about um, uh, Slack and Discord is I've also found it really helpful to use TAs on um, or student leaders or whatever you have access to as sort of moderation, both because I have also seen sort of like these situations go wrong and become places that are not welcoming for um, marginalized students. And I think that moderation can really, really help uh, ensure that that doesn't happen. Um, and then also that those students TAs can can be modeling, you know, the behavior that you want to see. So actually, this is a lot of this is what we talked about over dinner last night, yeah. um, which is really cool to hear about from and people who know way more about this stuff than I do. Um, but yeah, having students who are showing sort of what is, you know, that you can be, this is a safe place to ask questions. And I think it can even be a positive thing, even if you send a DM, like a student sends a DM and like you're saying, it's kind of annoying, right? To then sh share it back and say, well, somebody asked this question, here's the answer. I think that can also be a really validating experience for a student to think like, oh, well, the question I asked was important. was important enough that the answer is getting shared back to the community. So I think that enough, you know, an amount of that isn't necessarily a bad thing either. Um, and yeah, code of conduct is also super important to this, as Carl highlighted. And you can cheat. 
you can have ringers do that for you. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> want to like do that and then like create a culture where people are like leaving emoji responses. Yeah, yeah. Or something. Sure. Like, yeah, definitely get yes. other people to do fake accounts and make it happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Also with like, if you have a fake account, it's something you can do if somebody's shy to share to public and say like, somebody asked this question and then have a student, another student say, oh, I was wondering that too. Right. I was right. also had that question so that they know that that question isn't embarrassing, that it's not mm -hmm. something they should have known. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't be afraid to be slightly diabolical. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, um, I want to let uh, folks go who are on Zoom or anyone who wants to take off somewhere, but thank you so much to everyone who joined. I think this was a really, really valuable discussion. Um, thank you everyone who came on Zoom and shared your experience and perspective. Um, and yeah, and thanks to Steve um, also, especially for kicking things off with such a, a rich uh, set of experiences on OED.